All right, welcome to this uh, particular presentation. Uh, we're really excited to have everybody join us for today. Um, we will be um, recording this presentation and that will be uh, available and posted on the YouTube channel for the Center for Bee Ecology, Evolution and Conservation in the next sort of day or so. Um, just a few housekeeping items. Um, after this presentation, we will have a question and answer period. Uh, please ask your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, and this will basically allow us to be able to keep track of all the questions and they don't get lost um, amongst all the different posts. Uh, since we are coming together virtually and from across different regions across the planet, um, I would like to acknowledge that I'm coming to you today from the territory of the Anishinaabeg, Haudenosaunee and Ojibwe nations. York University also would like to recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Takaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, and the Métis. It is now home to many Indigenous peoples. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. Dr. Onofurko would additionally like to acknowledge the land that he is joining us from today is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. The Algonquin peoples have lived on that land since time immemorial. If you'd like to find out a little bit more about the indigenous cultures and treaties of your region, please visit www.native-land.ca. And now I'd like to welcome Dr. Lawrence Packer, Distinguished Research Professor at York University. Well, uh, good morning world, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. It gives me great pleasure to introduce you to two uh, excellent bee systemists and who are going to talk about cuckoo bees today. And uh, just for those of you that are living in nice warm places, it snowed here this morning. Uh, so first of all, Catherine, uh, she became interested in wild bees while she was working for the Ge US Geological Survey at Colorado State University. Uh, she then took on a research technician position with Rufus Isaacs at Michigan State University. Then she went on to the University of New Hampshire and did a master's degree on uh, agricultural aspects of bee diversity with Sandra Rehan. And currently she's still with Sandra Rehan, but at York University, uh, looking at biogeography and evolution of the bee genus Nomada. Uh, our other speaker today is Thomas Furco. Uh, he did an MSc with uh, Miriam Richards at Brock University and became interested in cuckoo bees at that time. And so he did a PhD with me at York on systematics uh, of the genus Epiolus. He's then done a postdoc at the Canadian Museum of Nature, where he is currently a research associate and also is back working with me as a visiting postdoctoral fellow looking at phylogenetics of two Kleptoparasitic bee genera. So, with no further ado, I will pass everybody over to Catherine and Tom. Hello, everyone. I'm just going to share my right. screen here. All right. Can everyone see my slide, my slide presentation? Yes, it looks great, Tom. Okay, great. Well, uh, greetings, and uh, thank you for joining us for today's talk on diversification in two groups of kleptoparasitic nomadine bees, uh, Epiolini and the monotypic tribe Nomadini. Very briefly, kleptoparasitism is a common life strategy in bees exhibited by about 13% of all bee species globally and 20% uh, of all aphid bees. That is according to the most recent estimate of which I'm aware. Although bad for solitary bees, kleptoparasitism is important for ecosystem functioning, 
Uh, so much so that kleptoparasitic bees have been shown to be associated with healthy bee communities and are thus potentially important bioindicators of the state of the environment. Uh, we know that this uh, life strategy evolved independently within four bee families, Apidae, Calettidae, Helictidae, and Megachylidae. And it is the exclusive life strategy of an entire bee subfamily uh, and that subfamily, of course, is Nomadinae within Apidae. So Nomadinae is both the largest taxon of kleptoparasitic bees and the largest subfamily within Apidae with more than 1,600 species. Our talk today will focus on the two largest tribes within Nomadinae, Nomadinae, which is represented by about 800 species, all in the genus Nomada, and D. Pialini, which has about 330 species. Until recently, uh, Nomadinae was comprised of 10 tribes represented by about 1,300 species. Uh, in these bees, the female sixth sternum, illustrated here, uh, is largely retracted. It is truncate, marginate, uh, or pointed apically, and usually has spine like apical or preapical CT. Additionally, many but not all nomadine females uh, have a pseudopygidial area on the apicomedial part of the fifth turgon. So phylogenetic studies have supported the monophyly of nomadine. Uh, however, molecular studies starting with that of Cardinal et al. 2010 placed nomadine within an even larger clade of kleptoparasitic bees that includes most uh, other kleptoparasitic apids. As a result, the subfamily was subsequently expanded to include these other kleptoparasitic groups by Bossert and colleagues in 2019, and uh, now consists of uh, three named clades. So there is an Aracrosidine clade, which uh, is, consists of eight tribes, the tribe Melectini, which appears in a separate clade, and a clade that includes all of the nomadines in the traditional sense, although now divided among eight rather than uh, 10 tribes. And so in light of the uh, molecular phylogenetic and phylogenomic analyses, the number of independent origins of kleptoparasitism inferred within Apidae has been reduced uh, from an estimate of 11 to four or even as little as three. So Nomadine is not only very diverse, but also extremely widespread, being represented in almost all of the major terrestrial regions where bees are present, uh, the exception is the continental fragment of Zealandia, um, which has no nomadine bees. Uh, an unusual feature of nomadine is that these bees do not follow Emery's rule. Uh, most of the other major kleptoparasitic bee genera that come to mind, like Celioxus, Sphacodes, and Stelis, evolved within um, non-parasitic tribes and are more closely related to their hosts than any nomadine bees are to theirs. And although nomadines too originally uh, evolved from non-parasitic ancestors, uh, nomadines have since radiated onto a variety of host bee taxa and different families, which would explain their diversity and nearly cosmopolitan distribution. Being kleptoparasites, nomadine bee larvae have evolved to become hospicidal. Uh, specifically, it is the first instars of nomadines that are hospicidal and morphologically adapted to seeking out and killing the eggs or larvae of their hosts. Uh, unusual features of the first instars may include a pronathus head, uh, enlarged sickle-shaped mandibles, um, one or more lateral tubercles, which presumably have a sensory function, uh, and modifications to the abdomen to facilitate mobility, such as the presence of lateral body tubercles and or a pygopod. Interestingly, uh, these features are lost in subsequent instars. So nomadine bee larvae undergo a form of hypermetamorphosis. And you can see how dramatically different the first instar is from a more mature fusiform larva of the same species, in this case, Epiolus americanus. Uh, depending on the taxon, nomadines may exhibit closed or open cell kleptoparasitism. The former has been inferred as the ancestral state for the subfamily, but most nomadines now exhibit open cell kleptoparasitism. So I will now shift to uh, my portion of today's talk, which will focus on the evolution and diversification of epioline bees. So the tribe Epiolini uh, is comprised of eight genera, 
triapiolus, epiolus, duringiella, adenoropsis, pseudepiolus, rogepiolus, rhinopiolus, and thalestria, of which triapiolus and epiolus are by far the largest. Uh, they are also the only epiole lines represented in the old world, epiolus much more so than triapiolus, whereas most of the remaining genera are exclusively neotropical. Uh, the exception is adenoropsis, uh, which ranges into the Neoarctic uh, as far north as the southwestern United States. Epiole lines take as hosts a variety of bees. Uh, Tripiolus, which is the most species rich epiole line genus, also seems to be the most plastic in terms of host choice. Um, and suspected or confirmed hosts have been identified in six of the seven bee families, Tina Tritidae being the exception. Nevertheless, uh, most known associations are with eucerine bees, with Melisodes being the most common host genus. By contrast, Epiolus, which is the second largest genus in the tribe, has so far only definitively been associated with a single genus, and that is Calides. However, Calides is a large genus with more than 500 species occupying a variety of ecological niches. Um, so it is unsurprising that Epiolus uh, should also have become a very species-rich genus. Like Triapiolus, Duringiella um, also seems to be somewhat plastic in host choice, whereas Adenoropsis has only been associated with Tyloglossa and Thalestria only with Oxea, and hosts have yet to be identified for the remaining three epioline genera. The first genus level phylogeny for the entire tribe was proposed by Molly Wright Meyer in 2004, based on parsimony analysis of 102 morphological characters. Uh, as a result, Epiolini was subdivided into four subtribes, Adenoropsina, Rogipiolina, and Dipiolina, which are monotypic, and Thalestrina, which includes the remaining five genera. In this classification, a lot of emphasis was placed on the morphology of the female sixth sternum, 14 characters in total. That of Epiolus is perhaps the most unusual among Epiolini in that the posterolateral processes are convergent spatulate and bear short peg-like CT modified for cutting or punching through the cellophane-like lining of their Calides host nests, through which Epiolus females lay their eggs. Uh, additionally, between the two lobes is a, uh, between the two processes is a large lobe uh, that presumably um, adds to uh, the rigidity of the, 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 the female sixth sternum and reinforces the entire structure. In the other subtribes, uh, the processes, as you can see, are parallel um, uh, and rod-like and have a numerous elongate CT, presumably modified to rake the sandy substrate into which, um, into which the, uh, these bees lay their eggs. And in Adenoropsis and Rogipiolus, the disc is elongate, as in Epiolus, uh, whereas it is short, uh, sometimes reduced to just a narrow transverse bar in Thalestrina. Monophyletic Thalestrina was also recovered in the first molecular phylogeny of Apidae uh, by Cardinal et al. 2010. Although the clade had weak support in the Bayesian maximum clade credibility tree, uh, and support was negligible in the maximum likelihood tree. But we do see strong support for the monophyly of Epilini and also uh, for its placement as sister to the tribe Brachinomidini. Interestingly, and contrary to expectation, in the two most recent phylog phylogenetic and phylogenomic reconstructions, the Lestrina was rendered paraphyletic. This is because Epiolus and Tripiolus were in both cases recovered as sister taxa. This finding was surprising due to their dissimilar morphology, especially with regard to the female sixth sternum, but it makes sense from a biogeographic perspective since both genera seem to have their origins outside the neotropics. By contrast, Epiolini and presumably also its sister tribe Brachinomidini are neotropical in origin. Much of what we know about the patterns and processes of diversification in Epiolini comes from research on the B genus Epiolus, which is an ideal study model for several reasons. Uh, for one, it is one of the larger and more globally widespread phytoparasitic B genera, so processes that contributed to its diversification uh, might have also played a role in the evolution of other phytoparasitic B genera. 
Uh, it is better resolved taxonomically than many other kleptoparasitic bee genera. Uh, and as many taxonomists know, uh, kleptoparasitic bees are notoriously difficult taxonomically, so this is an important consideration. And um, the association uh, of Epiolus with a single host genus um, also makes it easier to identify host parasite associations and enables phylogenetic comparisons. Here is the expanded version of the Onoferico et Albazian tree I presented on the slide before the last one that showed uh, the relationships among Epiolini genera. Uh, you can see that there is strong support for the monophyly of Epiolus, which can be subdivided into six major clades, five with strong support. I uh, indicated Trophocleptria here uh, as it was previously regarded as a subgenus within Epiolus, and some sources have even treated it as a separate genus altogether, believing it to be sister to Epiolus, but that classification should be abandoned as Trophocleptria clearly renders Epiolus paraphyletic. The relationship of the major clades to one another uh, remains uh, remain unclear as there is insufficient support for the backbone topology. Nevertheless, an Arctic origin for the genus seems most probable with all the old world species sampled in this study uh, forming a monophyletic clade, uh, clade F shown here at the bottom. This map illustrates the inferred patterns of geodispersal in Epiolus. The Bering Land Bridge is the only likely route available at the time that would have enabled Epiolus to reach the old world and to uh, really have allowed for any um, significant terrestrial uh, faunal exchanges between the Eurasian and North American land masses. In South America, Epiolus is represented by very few species with only three endemics. Uh, and it seems to have arrived there quite recently uh, in geological terms via the uh, Isthmus of Panama, as it is almost entirely absent from the Lesser Antilles. So what were some of the actual drivers of diversification uh, in Epiolus through space and time? Having mapped the known ranges of the extant species in this phylogeny based on comprehensive georeference locality records, uh, we carried out a spatial analysis of vicariance implemented in the vicariance inference program and thereby inferred 33 instances of speciation as having occurred in allopatry, i.e. in the presence of a barrier. The pie charts and boxes indicate the disjunct nodes. To be considered disjunct, the maximum amount of range overlap allowed between sister taxa was set to 25%. Um, many of the inferred barriers were unique, as you might imagine, um, but a few seem to have played a recurring role in speciation. Uh, for example, a plurality of disjunctions were attributed to an east-west divide in North America with the Great Plains and or Rocky Mountains um, representing pre-existing barriers to gene flow that Epiolus had to cross. Uh, since this study was published, a new species of Epiolus from uh, Western North America has been discovered, which is sister to a species found only in Eastern North America. Uh, it is currently in the process of being described, uh, but adds yet another example of speciation in allopatry attributed to this particular barrier. Another four pairs of sister species are separated between the uh, Florida Peninsula and other parts of Eastern North America, including the Florida Panhandle. Uh, these divergences, as you can see, were quite recent. Uh, the peninsula was largely inundated during the early interglacial periods of the Pleistocene. So the parts that were not submerged uh, presumably served as refugia where the peninsular forms differentiated from the mainland ones. Of course, species do not evolve in isolation. So what are some of the biological factors that contributed to diversification in Epiolus? To address this question, we looked at the history of its relationship with its host genus, Calides. And a test of independence revealed that these two clades, which are limited to the species for which associations are known or strongly suspected, did not speciate independently with respect to one another. Uh, the analysis called parafit uses distance matrices to compute an overall value of similarity between associated trees. Uh, in this case, uh, a Calides Bayesian maximum credibility tree and a pruned version of the Epiolus uh, phylogeny that I showed you earlier. 
Uh, random host parasite associations are then permuted for comparison. And if the observed similarity is greater than expected by chance, the null hypothesis that the two clades species speciated independently is rejected. And that turned out to be the case here. Uh, the contribution of each association to overall congruence is uh, then assessed by removing host parasite links uh, one by one. And so in this tanglegram, uh, solid lines indicate links that contributed uh, significantly to non-independence, whereas um, the hatched lines uh, indicate links that do not. And we can see that in only about half the cases was host speciation influenced by kleptoparasite speciation and vice versa. Through what's known as the reconcili uh, reconciliation analysis implemented in the program Jane, we also aim to explain how relationships between extant Kalides and, e and Epiolus became established, given their associations, tree topologies, and time constraints imposed on speciation events, while assigning a cost to each event type. And so five event types are considered in this analysis. They are co-speciation, which by default has the lowest cost as it is considered the most parsimonious event. Um, there's also duplication, uh, which is uh, when two parasite species end up attacking the same host species. Host switching, so after uh, speciation, uh, the kleptoparasite shifts to attacking uh, a host species on a different part of the uh, phylogeny. There is also parasite loss or extinction. And finally, uh, a failure to diverge. So um, that happens when the host speciates, but the parasite does not. And so you have one parasite species attacking two host species. Uh, this event has also been referred to as missing the boat. And so when the Epiolus tree was mapped onto the Kalides tree, there were only three places where speciation events between associated species overlapped. So contrary to Fahrenholtz's rule, Co-speciation appears to have been a rare event in the evolution of these two genera. The most commonly inferred event type turned out to be parasite loss. Now to account for the possibility that the inferred events were the result of inaccurate dating of the two trees, uh, time constraints were removed so that only topological but not temporal congruence was considered. And even still, co-speciation was identified as uncommon in the evolutionary history of these two genera with only four cases identified. So even though the relationship between Epiolus and Kalides seems to some extent have resulted in co-evolutionary diversification, uh, more speciation events within Epiolus were attributed to historical barriers to gene flow. What we don't know is to what extent the same barriers that contributed to speciation in Epiolus also contributed to speciation in Kalides. That is because the species level phylogeny uh, for Kalides with complete taxon sampling is lacking, especially for North America, where there is more information on the associations between species of Kalides and Epiolus than anywhere else. However, there is strong evidence uh, that Kalides is older than Epiolus and that it originated in South America, whereas Epiolus appears to have originated in North America, and presumably it is there in North America where the relationship between these two genera formed. And of course, it should be mentioned that um, you know, it is due to the success of Kalides uh, in having colonized and diversified across much, much of the globe that made it possible for EPLs to do the same and to have also uh, to now also have a nearly cosmopolitan distribution. What other biological factors might have contributed to diversification in Epiolini? Well, morphological comparisons suggest that mimicry has played an important role, especially in the neotropics and uh, in warmer parts of North America. For example, here are five pairs of sister species, most of which cannot be told apart by DNA barcodes. The top row shows species present in Eastern North America, excluding the Florida Peninsula, whereas the bottom row shows species endemic to peninsular Florida. For reasons presumably related to mimicry, but unclear, Hymenoptera in Florida have a tendency uh, of exhibiting extensive red integument coloration and reduced pubescence. In this case, most obviously on the mesoscutum and metasomal turga. 
In multiple EPOLN genera, there are, there are species that look uh, conspicuously like potter wasps um, in the subfamily Eumenonae. Uh, and some of these, the prono the prono collar uh, is unusually thickened and anteriorly straight, as is the case in Eumenines. Uh, the wings may be folded longitudinally at rest and thus appear characteristically wasp-like. Normally in Epiolus and Triepiolus, the first uh, turgum, abbreviated here as T1, has both basal and apical bands of pale pubescence. But as you can see in these species, only a basal band is present. So this gives the illusion that these bees have an elongate second turgum, which of course is characteristic of, of potter wasp. Although if you look carefully, uh, you can see that the dark area in the EPL lines actually extends across both the first and second turga. Uh, here are some other EPL lines as time in the genus uh, Duringiella that resemble some South American potter wasps. There are several um, other wasps and even non-parasitic bees like Megachyle Uzona that have similar markings. Uh, and these include bright orange antennae and legs, uh, as well as um, whitish bands on the first and second metasomal turga. And uh, there are also uh, long, erect black hairs on the mesosoma of these species of Duringiella, which is unusual for E. Piolini. In three genera, there are species that um, uh, strongly resemble neotropical wasps in the genus Paracaturgus. Uh, and one of these, Adeneropsis, seems to consist entirely of polystyne mimics. The dark integument coloration and lack of bands of pale pubescence are obvious enough, but note also the clear or whitish wingtips. Normally in Epiolini, it is the wingtips that are uh, darkened and the bases that are uh, lighter, hyaline, or supineline. Here is an interesting example suggesting strong selective pressure toward mimicry. These two species are indistinguishable by DNA barcodes, but the one on the left uh, superficially looks like a Paracaturgus wasp, whereas the one on the right resembles a Eumenine wasp. The known ranges of these species show no overlap, with the one on the left occurring from Costa Rica south to Bolivia, and the one on the right occurring from northeastern Mexico south to the northern triangle of Central America. So the evidence for divergence is strong, despite the apparent lack of genetic differentiation, uh, this is perhaps yet another example of why it should be considered bad practice to describe species based solely on DNA barcodes, uh, because doing so risks overlooking uh, other, form, other lines of evidence suggesting heterospecificity. So what's next? Uh, these are some of the mysteries I'm hoping to resolve. Uh, the placement of Pseudipiolus within E. Piolini, which is uncertain at this time since no molecular data are currently available for the genus, uh, at least not as far as I'm aware. Um, in the most uh, comprehensive phylogeny for EPOLs to date, taxon sampling was nearly complete for new world species, but quite limited for old world species. So little is known about the factors that contributed to the uh, diversification of old world Epiolus or diversification of any of the other EPLN genera for that matter. Uh, it would be interesting to look at um, possible effects of host plasticity on nomadine evolutionary diversification, uh, in particular within triapiolus. At present, I'm working with colleagues to revise a couple of problematic species groups within triapiolus and toward constructing a UC phylogeny for the genus for which I don't yet have data to present, unfortunately. Uh, and I will also be studying the genus from a historical biogeographic context. Circumstantial evidence suggests that Triapiolus uh, originated in North America, like Epiolus, where, where it is most diverse, but all phylogenies to date have placed Eurasian Triapiolus as sister to the rest of the genus. Of course, taxon sampling um, has been very limited, and so uh, a more comprehensive phylogeny is needed. The paucity of uh, species of Triapiolus in South America, nearly all of which belong to a single species group um, that is also um, quite well represented in North America, suggests that Triapiolus dispersed uh, from South America, uh, from North America, uh, to South America from North America. But uh, these hypotheses remain to be tested. So stay tuned as there are any more discoveries to be made about the, G uh, about the bees in this amazing tribe. 
And at this point, I will turn it over to Catherine to tell you about her exciting work on Nomada. Sweet. So, um, all right. So let me pull up my talk. I believe it is this one. Let's share it. Uh, can everyone see uh, my slides? Yes, it looks great, Catherine. Cool, all right. So, hi everyone, my name is Catherine and I'm currently a PhD candidate in the Rehan Lab here at York University um, in Toronto. And just to let everyone know, uh, the manuscript that this talk is based off of is now available um, to be read. You can find it at MPE or Molecular Phylogenetics and Evolution. And it's under the same title as my talk, which is Phylogenomics and His uh, Historical Biogeography. <clears throat> Sorry, there's like a thingy popping up and I cannot see stuff. There we go. Okay, Biogeography of the Kleptoparasitic Bee Genus Nomada Using Ultra Conserved Elements. So I'll first start off with um, introducing you to the stars of my research, which is the genus Nomada. Why aren't you working? Okay, there we go. So the genus Nomada is the only one found in the tribe Nomadini. And current or most recent uh, molecular research has shown that the tribe Nomadini um, is sister to this monophyletic clade that is comprised of the Neolarini as well as the Hex Epiolini, as seen here in this image taken from SLES et al. Uh, 2022. So Nomada is considered the most diverse of all the kleptoparasitic bee genera, and it tops out around 800 species described globally. Uh, Nomada mostly parasitize uh, members of the genus Andrina. However, there is documentation that they will use four other families as hosts. And these four families are the Holictidae, the Calidae, the Molididae, as well as other members of uh, the family Apidae. Currently, um, Nomada are organized into 16 different species groups. This work was done by Byron Alexander in the late 1980s and early 1990s in which he took um, the old subgenera that were previously used to organize nomada and using cladistics and uh, morphometric, morphometric analyses, he reorganized them um, to make it easier and clearer to uh, classify the different species of nomada. However, since publication of these 16 different species groups, there is no, uh, there has been no subsequent um, investigation into whether these species groups are actually valid. So here we can see the old subgenera that were used prior to Alexander's work. And here you can see the current 16 species groups. Now, some of them such as like the Vigana species group, as well as the Rufocornis group were made by uh, condensing old, um, multiple old subgenera under one title but you can see that others such as Gigas right here, as well as Armada um, uh, were, were described at the time of this publication. Um, and here in this last column, we can see the different ecoregions that each of these old subject, uh, each of these species groups can be found. So most of them you're gonna see uh, are found in the Nearctic, the Palearctic or the whole Arctic regions. However, we do have some representation of the Neotropics, the Afrotropics, the Indomalaya, as well as the Australasia ecoregions. In terms of biogeography, if we look at this image taken from Discover Life, we can see that nomada occur mostly in the whole Arctic region. However, there is no comprehensive biogeography for the genus investigating this. We do have two competing hypotheses, however, of where nomada could have originated, as well as what these ecoregions are. And so the first hypothesis was actually predicted by Charles Michener, who by examining the immense species diversity found within what is now known as the Vigana species group, predicted that nomada must have originated somewhere within the Neotropics. This is contrasted by the hypotheses uh, predicted by Alexander, who suggested that nomada actually originated somewhere in the Afrotropics. And he based this hypothesis off of what he observed in the, morpho the morphology of what is now known as the Gigas species group. This group only occurs in South Africa, so this is why he placed the point of origin within the Afrotropics. Both of these hypotheses predict a southern hemisphere point of origin for nomada, in which through subsequent uh, 
dispersal events moved into the northern hemisphere and then eventually back down into the southern the remaining ecoregions within the southern hemisphere. So the overall goal of this project was to determine the global phylogeny as well as the biogeography for the genus Nomada. And in order to do this, we had three aims. The first of which was to develop that molecular phylogeny and then assess the validity of the current species groups and then finally map that historical biogeography. So we used 142 different species, 23 in our outgroup and 119 in our in-group and we uh, used UCE phylogenomics. So we followed this lovely pipeline illustration from Zeng et al. The first thing we did was extract DNA using non-destructive methods, which we then sheared and enriched and then sent off for, for sequencing. Once the sequencing was completed and we got that data back, we then used the pipelines Filucci as well as the program Spruce Up in order to demultiplex, clean, align, and analyze our data. Once that was done, we used the sliding window site characteristic entropy partitioning program in order to break our UCEs into three different parts. So that um, is our core UCE as well as uh, the left and right flanks. We then used IQ tree in order to uh, produce this nice phylogenetic tree that you see here. Once that was done, we did divergence dating using uh, the program MCMC tree, nine different fossils, and the program tracer. Once we had our, uh, our dated tree, we then put that into BioGeoBears for our biogeographical analysis. So this is the result um, from IQ tree. This is our tree. And we can see up here in gray is our outgroup, and everything else is our in-group. Um, and for confidence intervals, everything is 100 out of 100 unless otherwise noted. And so if we lay our 16 different species groups on top of this tree, you get an image that looks like this. And so the first thing I wanna point out is that it is not the Vigana species group as suggested by Michener, which you can find down here, nor is it the Giga species group, which was um, predicted by uh, Alexander, which is right here, that turns out to be sister to all other species groups. It's actually this tiny uh, species group called Odontophora, and this species group is interesting because it is very small. It only comprises of about three different species and they're all confined to the Paleoarctic region, mainly the Eastern Mediterranean. The second thing I wanna point out is up here. Um, and we can see that the species group formerly known as Superba and Basalis are now um, considered at least by our results to actually be just one species group. And this is because the Basalis has been found to be nestled right within the superba. The last thing I wanna point out is that we have an example of paraphyly in our tree, and this is occurring within the roof of cornice. We can see here that there is one large clade right here, and then we have this tinier clade um, highlighted in yellow. Now, the fact that there is paraphyly within the roof of cornice is not surprising, as this species group is known somewhat as what you could con consider a dumpster. So what happens in Nomada is that when you're describing um, new species and you're looking at the characters and you're trying to figure out which species group they should, it should belong to, Rufa Cornus is where species that have no characteristics that would place it definit definitively within a different species group go. So knowing that Rufa Cornus is basically um, a bunch of species that have nowhere else to be, and only is broken up into two um, monophyletic clades is quite surprising. Now, if we only focus on this one tiny clade that's highlighted in yellow, um, what's interesting is that this is a brand new species group. Currently, it's only comprised of species that are found in Eastern North America. And this is quite interesting because the, the group that it's actually sister to, Bifasciata, is only found within the Paleoarctic region. So this really warrants further investigation into this brand new species group. Here we can see the results of our BioGeoBears bio analyses. And if you look at this um, circle that is within another circle, uh, this is our stem ancestor. And we can see that our stem ancestor um, originated somewhere within the Nearctic around 79 million years ago. Now currently highlighted is what we found for our crown age for Nomada, 
we can see that it originated somewhere across the whole Arctic region around 65 million years ago. Now, if you scan quickly across the tree, you'll notice that most of the species groups are going to have um, a point of origin somewhere in the Palearctic, which is this red color, the Nearctic, which is this green color, or across the whole Arctic, which is this blue color. However, there are three exceptions to this. The first is the Giga species group, which is our first that originated somewhere within the Southern Hemisphere. And we can see that um, it has a point of origin within the Afrotropics. And this was around uh, 23 million years ago. Our second exception is for the Vagana species group, which has a point of origin somewhere between the, Neo the Nearctic and the Neotropics around uh, 28 million years ago. And the last one is uh, when the Ferva group moved from the Indo-Malaya ecoregion down into Australasia around uh, 10 million years ago. So for our conclusions, we can see that we have support for 14 of our uh, of the original 16 species groups. And we found support that there should be merging of the Superba and Basalis under one unifying name. We also found evidence that there is a new species group that is sister to the Bifasciata. And lastly, we found that our basal group or um, the group that is sister to all others was this odontophora. So if we transitioned into biogeography, we found that the stem ancestor for Nomada originated somewhere across the Neoarctic within the late Cretaceous period. And this is around 79 million years ago, as indicated by this arrow right here. We also see that the crown origin for Nomada is the, was in the early Paleocene, around 65 million years ago, somewhere across the whole Arctic. Now, we have two instances of what I consider our early northern dispersals. So this happened around 79 to 57 million years ago. And the first instance of this dispersal um, happened when the stem ancestor moved from North America or the whole or, or the Nearctic to Europe or the Palearctic, most likely via the De Greer land bridge, which took place around 79 to 65 million years ago. So if we look at this image right here, this is what the is believed to be around 70.8 million years ago of what the North Atlantic looked like. And we can see that the De Greer route here connected um, Northern Canada to Greenland and then to Northern Europe. So that was the first example. The second example of this early Northern dispersal was done by the ancestor of the Vincta species group, which moved from the Paleoarctic um, through the Thulian land bridge back into North America. So if we look at this image here, which is about 59 million years ago, and we zoom in to the Northern Atlantic, we can see that the Thulian route connected the Northern, uh, Northern Europe via the British Isles back into Greenland and then back into North America. We also have um, some, <clears throat> some examples of later Northern dispersals, and these mainly took place over the Bering Land Bridge. And so the first group of species, uh, the first collection of species groups I wanna focus on are the Adepta, the Belfragiae, and the Aragironis, which all have an emergence date of around 46 to 33 million years ago. And these three species groups are interesting because they're all confined to North America, but they have uh, common ancestors that are found across the whole Arctic region. So you can see from this image of the mid, the mid Eocene around 46 million years ago, you can see that the Bering Land Bridge is right here and it connects um, both North America uh, to uh, Europe and Asia. So there was even a more later or more a more current, I guess you could say, crossing of the Bering Land Bridge. And this was done by three more groups. This was the Robert Heotiana, the combined, combined Superba Basalis, and the Rufa Cornus. And this crossing took place around 19 to 10 million years ago. Now, these three species groups are interesting as well because uh, they currently have a whole Arctic distribution, and they're not only confined to North America like the previous three. So we can see during the mid Miocene, this is what um, the land masses <clears throat> were predicted to have looked like, it looks relatively closer to what we see today. And we can see that the Bering Land Bridge is right here. As mentioned earlier, there are three instances of Nomada moving from the, nor the Northern Hemisphere down into the Southern Hemisphere. 
And the first one of these dispersal events was done by Gigas. And this happened sometime around 45 million years ago during the mid Eocene. And so we believe through our results that Nomada most likely used this Eastern Iranian route that connected uh, the Middle East uh, to Africa. However, we cannot rule possible um, usage of this Western uh, European route um, into Africa as well. The second instance was done by Vigana when they moved into the Neotropics around the Eocene Oligocene transition, which was around 34 million years ago. So this is quite interesting because it predates the uh, formation of the Isthmus of Panama, um, which is estimated to happen around three to four million years ago. So if we look at this image, you can see 40 million years ago, um, there was complete separation between the two continents. And by 20 million years ago, you can see the Isthmus starting to form. So Nomada were moving into South America sometime in between this. So current uh, research into the formation of the Isthmus of Panama suggests that possibly um, it could have formed much earlier than the three to four uh, million years ago estimate. But there's also research that seems to suggest that it could have existed as a chain of islands. And if that is true, there was possible island hopping occurring within the Vagana species group as they moved down into the Neotropics. And our last instance of this southern dispersal happened when the FERVA group moved from, the, from Southeast Asia down into Australia around 12 to 7 million years ago. And this was during the late Miocene um, and via the Sula Spur. So around 20 million years ago, we know that Australia started uh, shifting in a northwards fashion, bringing it closer to Indonesia as well as the rest of Southeast Asia. And you can see that there were um, chains of islands. So it's possible and conceivable that Nomada were able to hop across and then into Australia. So in terms of future directions and where I want to take this work, I would really like to keep updating the phylogeny in order to include more species and more countries. We only used about 119 different Nomada species and in comparison to the total 800, um, that exist, that's kind of small. <laughs> so we want to just keep adding to the tree. We also would like to um, include more countries as this would help inform our uh, biogeography and really expand um, the, different, uh, the different ranges for a lot of our um, information. I'd also like to include additional biogeographical analyses. This includes other programs that would um, be compar comparable to BioGeo bears, and that way we can start comparing analyses to see if things are able to match up. And lastly, I would like to include climate data because climate data will help inform us of the environment that the Nomada are um, have evolved through, but it will also help us have a better understanding of what the environment looked like. Were there glaciers? How were they um, affecting what we see in the trends of BioGeo? biogeography for Nomada, how is like rising or lowering sea levels affecting what kinds of routes are being are available to them, things like that. So with that, I would like to thank um, the lab for their continued support, as well as all the people who loaned me the specimens that were specifically used in this project. And I would like to thank our funding sources, and also you guys for listening to my talk, as well as Tom's talk. Yeah, oops. <laughs> Hooray. Super. Thank you both. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. Uh, it's always great looking at pictures of bees and hearing about their phylogeny and evolution and biogeography. What a, what a lot of fun that was. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so I'm going to go to the Q&A and I'm going to ask the questions that remain there. Some have been answered live. So the first one is from Jacob Strucker. And Jacob, we've never met, but I'm glad you now know what I look like. And thanks for coming to these talks. Um, so what do you think about the position of fossil Paleoepiolus michineri? that is of Paleocene age. And as it's got that, in its generic name, I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm guessing that's directed toward me. Um, yeah, so, so we considered, uh, 
using that fossil and tip dating, but quickly abandoned the idea because um, its its position uh, among the Madene is is unclear. Uh, in the Dehon et al. Uh, tree, Paleopeolus mitchneri um, was placed as sister to Melectini, and that clade was then placed as sister to Epiolini, and that clade as sister to Nomadini, which doesn't make any sense. Um, Melectini, the most recent studies have shown that it is, is, is sister to the rest of Nomadine. So um, without knowing um, you know, where, where it is, it sits on the evolutionary tree, um, we were unable to use it in tip dating. And so uh, we ended up using a secondary calibration point to date the phylogeny um, we, uh, uh, based on, based on um, uh, the inferred dates of the Cardinal et al. Uh, phylogeny of Apidae, which was uh, fossil calibrated. So I guess you got to look at those fossils personally at some point. <laughs> well, there's an image of them, but I think the the only the only part that seems to be sufficiently preserved um, is is uh, is the wing, and um, yeah. So I, <laughs> I'm I'm not I'm not sure how how reliable uh, looking only at wing morphometrics is to place, uh, you know, to to, to confidently place a, a, a fossil. Um, you know, it, within the, it within would the depend how you life, but, but I'm not an expert on, on fossil bees, so I, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it depends how you analyze your data. The, the Denny Michel and his group have been doing lots of work placing, uh, placing things based upon uh, wing vaccination. Um, I'm just going to point out that we're, I'm only going to be looking at questions that are in the Q&A. Some are coming up in the chat. So if you've sent a question on the chat, please re resend it on the Q&A. Otherwise, I'm going to get lost. Okay, thanks uh, for that answer. So the next question is also about Epiolini. Don't feel upset, Catherine. I'm doing these in the order they came in on. And so obviously, the first set of questions are going to be about the first talk. Uh, so this is from Marek Stanton. Do Epiolini lack a strong sting? I'm curious as to what reason the bees mimic the wasps. So um, they are capable of sting. I've been stung by, by Epiolus scutellaris just last summer and it does hurt. Um, but uh, the reason, I, so this, I, I think that this is, you know, a form of mimicry that is somewhat malarian, but maybe mostly Batesian. Um, and that is simply because the, the wasps are a lot more numerous. So uh, for example, Paracaturgus and Brachygastra are both social wasps. You're gonna be encountering them a lot more than you are any of these EPO lines. Um, anyone who's caught a bee, you know, an EPO line bee, if you're excited about them as much as I am, will, will, um, will have noticed that they are rather uncommon bees. Um, also, um, you know, the, the, the fact that you had, um, uh, uh, species evolve independently these traits and patterns um, and and are not you know and that is not the ancestral state um, in these EPO line genera suggests that you know EPO lines are the ones that are you know mimicking um, the wasps more so than the other way around but these are to some extent you know mimicry complexes um, but I think it's it's the EPO lines that are more benefiting from from uh, being in that complex than the other wasps are I also want to point out that um, even though EPO line stings are painful, um, humanine wasps, uh, a lot of which have uh, the word adineros as their root, that is the Greek word uh, meaning painful. So <laughs> I do think that um, that uh, you know it is really the you know the, the, the EPO lines that are more benefiting from this relation uh, from this uh, from having this appearance of, of wasps um, than the wasps looking like the those EPO lines. I can vouch for the fact that these wasps are extremely painful. I dropped a piece of equipment underneath a nest of one once because they were stinging me and I came back a couple of hours later and they came back at me again. So I left the piece of equipment behind, which isn't something I would normally do. Um, yes, the, the polybiine or epiponine wasps have got really nasty stings. Um, so Parker Smale asks, why did the widespread success of Kalides contribute or allow for the success of Epiolus? Uh, so, well, this, this is 
um, so EP, uh, EPO lines or club to parasitic bees in general, um, their geo ability to geo disperse is really constrained by host movement. So, you know, if Kalides never made it to the old world, I don't see how, you know, given its strong association with that particular genus, I don't see how it would have been possible for Epiolus um, to do the same. So, um, you know, it's, it's that there, there needs to be opportunities for, for Epiolus to be able to diverge um, and radiate onto, onto, onto um, a variety of, of host taxa. And the way you can do that, that it, you know, if you're constrained to a relationship with one genus, is you know that genus has to be large and globally widespread as well. Okay, thank you. Um, so I when asks, what's the evolutionary advantage of mimicry between Epiolini and Potter wasp? Is it a form of Batesian mimicry? I guess that's large. That's been answered, I think, already. Uh, Jason Gibbs, Namadra ID can be brutal. So this is aimed at Catherine. I'm curious what your strategy is for vouchering in your phylogeny. Do you have barcodes extracted and available? Also excited to see spherogastra, binotarda, etc. So for our tree, all the UCE data is now available at NCBI. And I think I we put it up on Dryad as well. Um, if it's not available yet, it should be soon. I think it should be released now since the paper is out, but it's all there. Um, I think in, I think it's this version of the tree. Sphero-gaster is already included. Um, I believe it's in the Rufocornis group. Um, so yeah, it's there. I think that answers the question unless there's more. Uh, well, the, a part of it was, do you have the barcodes? Barcode we don't have available. We don't have barcode data just because you can extract barcode data from UCEs. Um, but yeah, so if the UCE contigs and the information should be up on Dryad is where we deposited it. Okay, so yes. the barcodes are separated out as a separate set of data, but they're in there somewhere. They're in the UCEs. So there's yep. a command for in Filucci that will separate out um, barcode data. Super. Yeah. Michael Brandstetter, hello, Michael. Uh, what are the host in Nomada? Is there evidence for co-diversification between Nomada and hosts? Mm. So it depends on what, what species you're asking about because most of them will, uh, they do go to Andrina species, but there are examples of um, others such as uh, Nomada articulata, which only seems to use uh, what is it, agapostamin as its host, but there's also examples of lazioglossum. There's, uh, I think Superba is attracted to eucerines or eucerines. So it just depends on what, which like species you're asking about. But the majority is Andrina. As for co-speciation, I haven't done any work. I know that the Andrina paper that came out fairly recently did some of that, but I don't know how accurate that uh, that analysis is just because I did some digging into like the data and it seems that um, what if you dig into it, um, it seems that I would say that uh, they use uh, basically one species group in order to track that co-host association. And so it makes me kind of question uh, if you can apply that information for Nomada as a whole and not just that species group, but it just needs more information, I think, and more, more research, so, yeah. Okay, thank you. So Nora Romero says she enjoyed the talks a great deal and asks a question of each of you. So the first one's to Tom. Um, can you provide more de details about the new species of Epiolus from the West? Who caught it, when and where? Um, yeah, so actually uh, I, I ended up finding, so dur during my PhD when I revised the genus, uh, there were two mystery specimens that I was, you know, I wasn't un ex entirely clear what they were. And so they were omitted from my revision. And I've since then come across um, multiple uh, yeah, more representatives of 
um, that particular form in various institutions. Um, and at that point, I, I realized that they represented an undescribed species. Uh, Corey Sheffield barcoded one, one specimen. He's a, he's a co-author on the, the paper in which we were describing the species. Um, and uh, it shares a bin with Epiolus autumnalis. That's how we know that it, you know, it's sister species. Um, so barcodes don't tell it apart, but um, the ranges don't overlap at all and the morphological differences um, are consistent between the two. I submitted that paper to Insectamundi last week, so we'll see <laughs> what happens with it. Fingers crossed. And Nora asks, Catherine, will you describe the new Nomada species in the East? The species group? Um... I think that's like a goal. Right now we're currently just trying to figure out if it's only comprised of Eastern uh, North American species. So we've been um, getting more UCE data and so far it seems that it continues to grow with only Eastern species. So hopefully we'll be able to describe it in a future publication. All right, well, we all look forward to seeing that. Mm -hmm. um, Sebastian Irazusta, and I apologize for almost certainly incorrectly pronouncing your name. Uh, what makes Nomada in Eastern North America so difficult to identify the species? I personally think it's the keys. The keys are hard to understand. They're mostly like based off of color or if you look at um, the original keys, I think that's Mitchell, right? Uh, it's just really difficult to understand what he, like what is being used as like the morphology and just there's so much variation in those um, key characters that even when I try to ID them, sometimes I'll get one and then I'll look at a different one and it'll be like, I think these are the same, but there's so much variation that it just makes it more difficult. But if you're IDing Nomada, get really good at uh, tibial spines because those will really help you. Um, they're pretty stable as characters go. But does Mitchell use those a lot? Um. Not really, I feel. Um, I've had to include my own notes about how many tibial spines will, are included in certain species. And I've noticed that in Mitchell's key that a lot of them that he did describe eventually got moved or renamed as like, it was mostly imbricata. Um, so it just shows that there's a lot of variation within um, each species, so. All right, Michael Brandstead asks, how did cook who bees identify their hosts? Presumably not by using identification keys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's an excellent question. I think it's to, to, you know, to a large extent, a bit of a mystery. I'm sure there's, you know, they're visually uh, searching for host nests. I think probably senio chemicals probably pl play some role as well. Um, there's that one, one paper by Tengel and Bergstrom in the seventies that found that, um, uh, I think it was male nomada seemed to uh, secrete the same uh, kinds of uh, hydrocarbon si signals or semiochemicals exhibited by uh, their Andrina hosts. So I think that you know it's it's partly that and part partly you know just visually being out there and scanning for nest entrances and trying and <laughs> going in and seeing if it you know if it smells like home. I guess there's two papers from Tengel and Bernstrom that describe. Uh, Andrina chemicals are like similar chemicals from male nomada. And then I think it was like a paper by Kane that described um, how nomada look for holes and like their behavior of finding uh, Andrina or other hosts. I don't remember what the name of that paper was, but I do recall the fat image that described everything. <laughs> so, yeah. All and right. I think there's a third paper from that described Nomada chemical and behavior. And I think that one was from like maybe 2018 or some sometime fairly recently. And I think it came out of Germany and they had color photos of Nomada doing the behavior. Yeah. Neat. I'll have to look at that one. I, I'm not aware of that one. Um, I can send it to you. <laughs> please do. Um, Nathan Fesk asks, has anyone found an identification key for Western North American kleptoparasites, Nomada and Epiolini? There's no one key for Nomada. Um, you basically have to dig around in, in the keys that were from like the 1900s and piece together 
one key from that because they're very like they'll have a key for like five species and that'll be like five westerns and then you'll have to find another key that has different ones and you kind of just have to like mush them together but i there might be like a more comprehensive one from that the people out west use but that's what i've i found <laughs> You young, people, re, you young people refer to the 1900s as if it was such a long time ago. <laughs> that's, cool. that's over 100 years ago. <laughs> well, the early 1900s were 100 <laughs> years ago, but the 1900s ended, oh, it seems to me just like yesterday. Um, okay, Tom, Epiolini, there's keys to try yeah. Epiolus and Epiolus. Yeah, so Epiolus is revised for, there's a key to all North American species. Um, obviously, it doesn't include the new species that I'm describing, although I'll be um, uh, including amended versions of the initial key to, to be able to key out that, that species. So that's um, on a Ferco 2018 uh, published in, in Zoo Keys. Um, for Tri Epiolus, uh, only uh, a key to the females exists for uh, Western North America. There is currently no uh, key available to identify male Western triopiolus. Um, and so that, that makes it a lot more challenging. Molly Wright Myers revision did, I think, include some taxonomic remarks and, and, and characters for some species that could be, you know, in combination, uh, could be used to identify males, especially if, uh, you know, if there's, if there, if, if there are species that, uh, you know, stand out for, uh, you know, a lot more and, and are quite distinctive, not part of these large groups of, of you know, prize of cryptic species. But unfortunately, there's no key to um, to uh, Western male triopiolus at this time. Uh, Dinorosis, there's only one one species uh, found in the in the Western United States. I think it's a Dinorosis apache. Um, so if you find one of those, that'll be that'll be easy to <laughs> identify. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um... Sam Drogi says that you both gave lovely talks and he's interested in molecular insights into host, um, host I guess, gets co-evolution in the MADA, particularly in the Bidentata and related groups. So host associations? Um, host racing is what he typed in, mm -hmm. but I guess that means host coeval, you know, yeah. host, uh, you know, coevolution, co-speciation, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So I haven't done any sort of that kind of work um, yet, I guess. So I can't really answer to that. Again, I think the only one that, or the only paper that I know of that has done that recently is that Andrina paper. Um, but I can't really answer to it because I don't have my own data to um, assist with that. <laughs> um, but for like bidentates, they, I mapped them on my phylogenetic tree that we did for this project. And they're kind of just scattered about. There's no like, um, really no pattern that I can see yet. I mean, with more species being added to the tree, maybe there'll be some sort of pattern, but currently they just, there's nothing that really unifies them. Because going into it, I thought that they would come out as like one kind of monophyletic clade because that's how they're separated in the key. And that's not true, at least right now. So yeah, <laughs> not very fun of an answer. Sam also says uh, host racing would be within species associations with Andrina groups. Is there anything you'd like to add? So like, mm, can you repeat that one more time? <laughs> sure is. He says host racing would be mm -hmm. within species associations within Andrina groups. Yeah. So again, I don't, I don't have data to like actually make a informed answer other than just looking at the end that Andrina paper um, that is kind of interesting but again I I think it's a little bit questionable to state that Nomada um, is connected in terms of a co-host co or host association evolution um, so that's just my opinion. <laughs> 
Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, Laura asks, Tom, which eastern Epiolus is it that's the sister species to the undescribed western one? Uh, sorry, I, I answered that. That's Epiolus autumnalis. Yeah, I, I know you mentioned that, but I've forgotten. Otherwise, I would have answered it myself. <laughs> um, autumnalis. All right. Uh, Catherine Chow asks uh, for the dumpster nematoclave, the one that's larger. Are all of those species also from the Neoptic region? Nope, those ones are the whole Arctic. It's interesting because, at least in our tree, because of the sampling, you'll find sisters within that large clade. The one will be from the Nearctic, the other one will be from the Palearctic, and it's like kind of like alternating in certain places. In other places, they'll uh, group as like the Nearctic as well as the whole as well as the Palearctic, but nothing like that new little clade we found that was sister to the Bifasciata. Um, which is only Eastern North American. So. All right. Sam asks whether Rodeci has been investigated. Sam only uses species names for, for bees, and I have pres is that I believe that's a Nomadra, I guess. I don't. Nomadra Rodeci? Is that Yeah, looking? I'm trying to think which one that is. Um, yeah, I can't recall all the species because we've added more recently and I don't, I don't think we've included it yet. So maybe not. Um, but if we have some, it would be nice to include <laughs> in the tree if someone wants to send me some. <laughs> well, that actually, this is a good opportunity to request material for both of you. So any of the yes. Nomada that aren't in Catherine's data set, any of the Epiolini that that aren't in Tom's. If you, you don't have to if you have any, anyone has send any, please send to me. <laughs> yeah, please send Nomada. <laughs> Another question from Michael Brandstetter. Despite little barcode divergence between sister species, do the data produce reciprocally monophyletic clades? Have you looked at UCEs or other nuclear data? That's so, so I actually haven't, uh, yeah, no, I haven't looked at um, any other genetic markers um, in this group. Um, actually, so so these belong to um, that former subgenus Trophoclaptria, and that was the one that was the most poorly sampled for for New World species. Only about five out of the out of the twelve species in that group were included in that phylogeny, and the and for the ones that were um, the only molecular data available for some of them were just were DNA barcodes. Um, so yeah, I, I I mean that's why I haven't conducted any any formal analyses. You know, looking at um, drivers of, uh, you know, uh, or the, the evolution of mimicry in these groups because uh, um, um, phylog uh, or molecular data are quite limited for, for those uh, neotropical groups. Great. Okay. Eugene Scapular asks, have there been in any advances in morphological identification of Namada species in the Bidentata group? Um. Not that I know of. I haven't been uh, doing that quite yet. Um, mostly when I do ID for bidentates, the, um, the Mitchell key is actually quite useful for that. It's probably the easiest part of that key. <laughs> um, and I think it's the only one that's available, unfortunately. But yeah, that's the only resource I know of. So currently there's no update to it yet. All right, Jason Gibbs asks, is, are there any thoughts about using UCEs for taxonomy in Nomada? Uh, he thought that Aran, Nicola, and Fervida were synonymous, but there's a long branch between them. Some species in inverted commas uh, have very little or no branch lengths. I don't quite understand the question. <laughs> Okay, so using UCEs to determine species, uh, species limits. limits. Oh, I see. Possibly. I mean, so on our tree, there's some taxonomy stuff that's quite interesting because I know like at one point, um, I think, what is it? Bessii got changed into granite cherry, for example, right? But if you look at our tree, um, we have Bessii actually put down. And that's because when we ran the tree initially, granite cherry, which is in the Rufocornis group, actually showed up in Vincta. 
So that would indicate that possibly in terms of taxonomy, that one actually needs to be changed, um, maybe back into BSCI, which was part of Vinta. So I guess you can kind of use UCEs in order to look at species relationships and taxonomy that way. Um, but I've never, I haven't thought about it in that sense. Um, in terms of looking at like the short branch lengths, I, th I think, and I don't know because I haven't tested this, but I think what it's showing is like rapid diversification, right? Within the different species at those times. But I can't say definitively because I haven't looked at it in that sense. Um, but I think it might be like a good future venture into looking at how UCEs could be used for taxon taxonomic purposes in that sense, so. Well, Nemada Rodekai has got a whole pile of people excited by it. It's a Melita Americana parasite with hmm. unusual morphology. Um, and Jason <laughs> suggests you talk to Dan Caraval because presumably he has some. Okay. <laughs> So, I've got to the end of the questions in the Q and A. If anybody's uh, put a question into the chat, uh, this is your last chance to put it into the Q and A, and then I will ask the speakers your question, and I'll count down ten, nine. Uh, we're getting close to the end here. Uh, there's 90 people that have seen this through to the end of the questions. Thank you for your persistence. Uh, we're getting lots of comments about how great the talks were being sent through on the chat. And I think, Caroline, we will have, Caroline, we, we will have access to the chats for all these congratulatory comments um, later also, right? Uh, I believe so. All righty. Well, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, a worldwide audience. It's great to be able to say that just because of Zoom and pandemics. Um, but it is really nice having people from just about all of the major continents except Antarctica. Everywhere where there are bees, we've got people turning up for these talks. Although it's awkward timing for Australians, they're going to presumably watch the... Uh, except people like James Dory, who are Australians that have emigrated, uh, at least temporarily. Anyway, thank you all, and I will bring today's session to an end. The next talk is on Anthophorini by uh, Michael Orr, and that's going to be the last Wednesday of April. Thank you all very much. Bye for now. <laughs>